this week on the show. We're on Colombia's unspoiled island of Providencia, but where are all the tourists? Henry heads to Turkey to try his hand at painting on water instead of canvas. It's going everywhere up. Great. Is it okay? Yes. Plus, we're in the medieval city in Belgium for a wacky race where bathtubs rule. One that looks like a shed on a bathtub. It is unbelievable. And I'm having a cracking time in northern Japan. That really doesn't look appetizing. We start off this week on the remote Caribbean island of Providencia with its breathtaking scenery and golden sand beaches. It's a slice of paradise you won't have to share with the package holiday crowd because up until now there's no major tourism development here. It's mostly untouched. But all that could be about to change as James Clayton discovered. Basking in the south of the Caribbean Sea lies Providencia. Known throughout its history as an island that's harboured pirates like Captain Morgan. It's a place where traditions live on. Yes, me do that! I do that! People still speak English Creole here, even though it's been part of Colombia for over 200 years. The island is a paradise but there's something missing. On one of the most idyllic beaches on one of the most idyllic islands in the Caribbean, why are there no tourists here? The lack of holiday makers seems almost bizarre, but it didn't happen by accident. Getting to Providencia is actually really hard. For example, if you're coming from the UK, you have to get a flight from London to Bogota, and then get a flight from Bogota to a little Caribbean island called San Andreas, and then either get a rickety flight or a catamaran to Providencia. And it's not surprising as a result that there really aren't many tourists here. It's just too much of a hassle. Providencia's isolation is nothing new. It was established by English Puritans in part seeking isolation to practice their religion. Elkin Robinson is one of Providencia's biggest pop stars. And he proudly traces his ancestry back to his English relatives. In the history, this island had been English always, you know, and the Spanish always trying to take over the island. He says there's a danger of Providencia losing its identity to the neighboring mainland. Colombia is a country with a lot of different culture. You know, everywhere you go is different. Different climate, different food, different music, <laughs> different people. But Providencia's isolation from the mainland has also hit its economy. Food and drink are, for example, much more expensive than on the mainland. And so, Colombia has committed to extending Providencia's airport so it can take international flights. Many of the locals are up in arms. It's not going to happen. We are not going to permit it. Sophia Huffington is leading the protest against the expansion. She fears what happened in the sister island of San Andres sets a precedent. They opened an airport in San Andres in 1953 and start pulling away the territory from the people. So we have an example for them not to come and make the same mistake. Sixty years after San Andreas got its international airport, there are now high-rise hotels, casinos and 40 times more tourists than Providencia. Crime is now a problem and the locals are in a minority. However, other people in Providencia are more realistic about the benefits of visitors. Manuela and Rico rent out their spare room to tourists. 
soon as the government try to open more to the tourists, people right away, it's like a strike. They all get together and they say, no, this is not what's gonna happen here. It's not like the big tourist companies haven't tried to get into Providencia. This spa hotel was built by a prospector, but it lies empty. The locals never allowed it to be opened, claiming it breached planning laws. They will lose all those roots, all that culture, and they are just preserving it. In San Andres, now the island has changed the completely. Same. The children are not even speaking the language anymore. Spanish. So Providence is afraid that this same thing will happen. Although work has begun on the airport, locals have, for now, stopped the expansion. But Providencia's conundrum is a microcosm of the challenges that communities face from globalization across the world. Opening the island up would undoubtedly boost its economy. But the overdevelopment of the island of San Andreas means that many Providencians simply don't believe it's a price worth paying. The tourism is important, but I don't feel like we live from tourism. You know, I feel like the tourism live from us. James Clayton reporting there from the untouched island of Providencia. Now we head to Istanbul for a spot of Ebru painting, a Turkish art form that involves marbling or painting on water. Ebru has been around for centuries, growing in popularity under the Ottomans, then spreading to Europe. We sent Henry Golding to give it a go. We're going to make a daisy today. Okay. First, we have to choose colors. Which right. colors do you want to use? I like the blues. Okay, these are this good. one, yeah, maybe yeah. this one. Daisies are usually white with yellow, aren't they? So there's a white here. So you, you yes. want to start with the base? Okay. Yeah. So how do you do it? What's the technique? Uh, we first mix it and we start sprinkling. Okay, let me give it a go. So, okay. And then. It's going everywhere. I'm not sure it's as, uh, as good as yours. It's great. Is it okay? Yes. So the reason why the paint actually sticks on the top here is because uh, that canvas that we're using, it's made of water and starch, so it's a lot thicker than uh, the paint. Okay. This is almost like a chopstick. Yes. Right. We are using them to make these shapes. Now we are making the daisy. Okay. First we are going to start with the leaves. Okay. So this takes a little bit more control than the, uh, the flicking. Like a teardrop. We are going to do these to the leaves. Okay. It's more of a blob than a flower. A little bit of color. Stick a little bit of this in the middle. That looks like a, an egg rather than a daisy. This is where we actually print it out on paper now? Yes. Okay, so what do we do? You now lay the paper here. Oh, you lay it down. We just wait. We just pull it. Just pull it? Parallel to the ground. Okay. Should I show you? Should I show you? How is it? <laughs> <laughs> Not bad for it. You think it's pretty good yeah, for it's a first Yeah, it's great. Time? It's great. You're really talented. Do you think I'll be able to uh, <laughs> keep that? Turkish tradition yes. of marbling. <laughs> Still to come on the travel show. We're in Belgium for the annual international bathtub boat race, trying to keep the travel show's reputation afloat. I love this place, Comment. And my mission begins in the first part of a new series as I travel through Japan, taking on some of its most daunting dishes. So don't go away. The Travel Show, your essential guide wherever you're heading. Now we're off to Dinan in Belgium. The town's an hour's drive south of the capital Brussels and is known as the birthplace of the saxophone. 
But in more recent years, Dinan has become famous for its very unusual summer festival. We sent Joe Worley along to take part in one of the world's wackiest races. The River Meuse flows for nearly a thousand kilometres through France, Belgium and the Netherlands and has been an important trading route since medieval times. But in more recent decades, a stretch of the river here in Dinant, in southern Belgium, has become better known for its epic water fights that happen each year as part of La Regate de Banois, the bathtub regatta. Alberto came up with the idea for the regatta 35 years ago. He shows me the one kilometer route where the boats will race. J'ai entendu que quelqu'un en Italie, il, est, il avait fait une descente d'une rivière avec une baignoire. Et alors là, j'ai eu l'idée de faire la course de baignoire à Dino. Ils m'ont pris pour un fou, ils disent que je vais faire une course de baignoire sur la Meuse, c'est pas possible. Maintenant, oui, on va faire une course de baignoire. Et là, je suis allé chercher 40 baignoires, j'ai un ferrailleur, et j'ai distribué à chaque commerce une baignoire, je la mettais devant la porte. Et je dis, vous faites la course de baignoire. Was intended to be a one off, but 35 years later, it's still going. Je suis très fier parce que chaque année, je traverse Dinan en voiture, je regarde et je dis, c'est moi le fou qui a créé tout ça. <laughs> Originally, each competitor had their own bathtub, but now people create huge, elaborate floats. The only rule is that somewhere the design must incorporate a bathtub. People spend months secretly constructing their boats. And I'm heading to meet one crew who are putting the finishing touches to the raft I'll be racing on. Hello, bonjour. Hi. Hello. Oh, these are amazing. Yes, thank you. <laughs> nice to meet you, I'm Jo. And nice to meet you, Emily. They're enormous, aren't they? Yes, but it's not the biggest, huh? Yes, come with me. Okay. Wow. <laughs> Ready for you. You are very prepared. So is this our boat? Yes. The yes. theme of this year's regatta is famous people in Dinan. And Emmeline's chosen to represent the town's doctors. And the signs like Grey's Anatomy. Yes, yeah. Grey's Anatomy. It's my name. Ah. Emmeline Egre. That is very clever. And I can see uh, a bathtub there. Yes. People sit in here? Yes, me. Just here. Okay. <laughs> and where will I go? Yes, you can go here. I'll go in or... here as well. Emmeline and her family have been taking part in the regatta for the past 20 years. And it's all hands on deck to finish their fleet of three boats. You must have a fancy dress. Okay. Here are my scrubs. Very nice. Trousers as well. Fully kitted out in my doctor's scrubs, all that's left to do now is launch the bathtubs. Just making it nice for the trip. Better get in. And we're off. In what I think is the wrong direction. Which way are we going? Further down the river, we join the rest of the tubs on the start line. It's absolute chaos. There's a lot of shouting, a lot of chanting. Have we started now? Yes, I think. This is the race. <laughs> I start rowing as hard as I can. But I get the impression it's more about showcasing the bathtub designs than how quickly you can complete the race. There are some seriously impressive contraptions on this river. There's one guy over there who's barbecuing on his bathtub. And uh, further down the river, there's something that looks like a shed. I don't know, I'm just gonna keep rowing. <laughs> Soon it becomes clear that splashing the opposition is the aim of the game. You aren't allowed to try and sink other boats but it seems that anything else goes. I'm absolutely soaking wet. And the thousands of people who have come to watch aren't safe either. Oh, 
The town's bridge marks the end of the race, but no one seems to be too bothered about hurrying towards it. For us, the regatta ends in the same chaotic way it started, as we haphazardly paddle past the finish line. What a day. I'm not sure there were any winners or losers there, but it was so much fun. And they've told me that this is the only way to finish the race. After I've dried off from my dunking, there's an anxious wait to see if we've won a prize. An award for the team's creative bathtub design. It might seem silly, but I'm actually really excited about this because it was an intense race. I think I've earned it. To end this week, Japan's food can be just jaw-dropping, and most people new to the country make a beeline for the yakitori joints or sushias that you'll find everywhere. I've lived here in Tokyo for over three years now, and I love Japanese food, but there's still some I find quite intimidating. So with a little help from my translator, Yoko, Carmen. I'm taking my taste buds on a trip through this country Ooh. to try and understand what I'm missing out on. <laughs> Hokkaido is Japan's northern island. It's wild and craggy. In the winter, it's a snowy wonderland. After the thaw, the islanders are left with alpine meadows and crystal clear seas. So we're in the port city of Otaru, and I'm told this is one of the best places in all of Japan to find the freshest uni. Uni is Japanese sea urchin, or to be more exact, its reproductive glands. It's a fairly pricey delicacy, which you normally eat with soy sauce on top of a bed of rice. Carmen! Uh, ah, oh. Uni, oh, yeah. you found it. Yes. So this is quite a big pack of Uni. How expensive is this? Ikura desu ka? Ikura desu ka? 4,500 yen. Wow, that's just less than $45, around 30 quid. Expensive. Why is it so expensive? It's a little bit because the fishermen can fish on a certain period of time. So if this is the best uni in Japan, is that correct? Collecting them is hit and miss. The sea has to be perfectly still for the fishermen here to head out onto the water. Either they all go or none do. Luckily, I'm here at exactly the right time of year. Do you like uni? I love uni, but love uni. it's expensive, so I cannot eat every day. We can really just try uni out here. You don't have to cook it or anything. Sterilize it. So open it, put it in your mouth. Narita-san, is Manabu Narita's been fishing here for years. If anyone's ever earned the title Mr. Uni, it's him. What's that black container do? It's a goggle. Oh, it's a goggle. Yeah. To look under the sea. Wow. <laughs> I love this. It's so amazing. Japan is such a high-tech country. And the way he's finding the uni is by using some massive goggle and a net. Amazing. Oh. Wow, that's a lot. Ooh. Oh my God. It looks really spiky. Ooh. 
but really doesn't look appetizing. So you scoop it out like this. Oh. Oh. It looks it looks like a soggy dish sponge. Here we go. <laughs> it smells horrible. <laughs> okay. <laughs> mm. A bit like an oyster, really salty, but the consistency is oh. <laughs> <laughs> Hokkaido is also famous for its dairy. They say about half of all Japan's dairy cow population live out their days up here. So another thing people eat when they come here to Hokkaido is ice cream. And this is a seven tower rainbow ice cream. Check it out, oh my goodness. It's grape, strawberry, green tea, melon, chocolate, milk, and oh, lavender. Mm. Oh, I can't wait. Here you go, come uh, and this is your ice cream. Uh, We're okay, going to switch right. to ice cream. Let me guess, this is uni ice cream, right? Okay, well, I love ice cream, so maybe this is one way that I might actually enjoy uni. It's not so bad. <laughs> it does taste a little salty and a little bit seafoody, but I think this is the best way to enjoy uni, really, for me anyway. Uni may not necessarily be for me, but it's a genuine passion for some of the people who live here. And if you're looking for a proper, authentic taste of northern Japan, this is most definitely it. Are you sure I can't have that one back? Uh, I want to keep this, so no. Mm. <laughs> I got it back. Well, that's all we've got time for this week. Coming up next week... Addy travels through Sweden to find out about Stockholm's plans to become the most futuristic city in the world. This microchip implant sits right here. It's under my skin. I would never know it was there. And he also heads to the far north of the country to experience a chilly night on a block of ice. It's so cold. It's cold, man. And don't forget, you can join in our adventures on the road by following us on social media. But in the meantime, from me and this melting ice cream on the Japanese island of Hokkaido, it's goodbye.